Hello everyone, we are Taj Corp. We are um, working on the scale up of uh, aloe vera drag reducing polymers extraction. My name is Jason Carnes. My name is Hassan Yatim. I'm Amir Masavi. I'm Taylor Wild. Um, so before I get into too much of our uh, process, I'm going to go through a little bit of the background. Um, so why are we looking at AVDRP? Uh, to, uh, well, one common uh, reason is uh, for the treatment of hemorrhagic shock, um, which is when the body loses more than 20% of its blood volume. Um, this occurs often during uh, traumatic accidents, so um, around 30 to 40% of uh, trauma uh, re injuries, re traumatic injuries result in hemorrhagic shock. Um, now there's about, about 5 million globally that occur um, every year um, that result in death, um, but in the U.S. alone, there's around 30 million, which uh, uh, are non-fatal injuries where uh, treatment may be necessary, um, and at a cost of around 671 billion currently. So any any product which can uh, affect this market uh, would, would be uh, have have great potential. And now, Hassan's going to go into a little bit about um, what current treatments there are for hemorrhagic shock. So the most aggressive and most common method for treatment of the AHS uh, is intense fluid transfusions. The issue with this treatment is your blood pressure reaches very high levels, and this can lead to coagulopathy, which is when you can't form blood clots, acidosis, uh, when you're too acidic in your bloodstream, or hypothermia. So another method that has been developed and is in use is hypotensive resuscitation. This, uh, on, the, on the other side, keeps your blood pressure low at below 100 millimeters of mercury. Uh, the issue with keeping your blood pressure this low is you don't get enough uh, oxygen delivered to your tissues, so this can cause a lot of organ damage. So what about drag reducing polymers is beneficial for the treatment of hemorrhagic shock? Well, they allow for the um, better, allow for better diffusion of oxygen from red blood vessels to tissues and organs. Um, so this is important, especially during the um, hypotensive resuscitation treatment for uh, maintaining um, good oxygenation for organs um, so there, there's no damage that occurs. Um, they also reduce the turbi um, turbulence of, or the resistance to turbulence of the blood, um, which is, uh, which commonly occurs when um, someone is, experiences trauma. So th this is very important for, um, for actually treating uh, hemorrhagic shock. So why AVDRP compared to mo uh, uh, versus more common biocompatible polymers. Well, polyethylene oxide, uh, for those who know the biospace, is, is one very common bio po biocompatible polymer that's used. Um, however, in the treatment of HS, it tends to break down during high stress situations. So uh, when it's injected, it's, it's actually um, breaking down and not uh, delivering the full effect that you, you would look for, as, as we see with AVDRP. Now, AVDRP has shown positive results in animal testing, um, and it's also um, extremely portable due to uh, it being uh, effective in small doses. So this, this means it can be used effectively in the pre-hospitalization period where there are not many current treatments. So our vision is to bring a novel, affordable option to market for treatment of uh, hemorrhagic shock. We're looking to develop a, a lab scale procedure to uh, production scale um, to make it uh, widely available for uh, treatment of trauma victims, um, especially to uh, those who are experiencing hemorrhagic shock and the ill effects associated with it. So for actually deciding how we were going to do this. There were a few essential questions we had to answer. It was, can this be done at scale? Um, and can the, the process be easily replicated? What is actually most cost-effective and uh, safest method of producing aloe vera DRP? Um, we, did, we created three um, models for our three processes, processes um, that we looked at. Um, and Hassan will go into a little bit more about how we decided which one was which one was the optimal process to use. Uh, our first base, our first design, uh, which is called Extraction One or EX One, uh, was modeled after two Russian scientists named Marhevka and Kameneva. They performed their experimentation uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, and they only had positive results. 
There, uh, so we completely modeled our procedure after them. We had 11 total steps. Um, there were a lot of redundancies in this step. We have three centrifugation steps. We have two filtration steps and two mixer steps. Uh, one thing that we sought to remove was, the, uh, was having uh, an extraction of the aloe vera gel from the leaf straight into a mixer. We were attempting to combine those so that we didn't need those two unit operations. Um, please go to the next slide. Here we have our second design where we solve some of these problems. Uh, it's called simplified extraction one. Uh, so here we sought to become more efficient and economical uh, and we did this by uh, making changes to our centrifuge and removing the first filtration step. So for the centrifuge, we uh, ran it at room temperature. The original protocol uh, asked for four degrees Celsius to be chilled uh, and it also asked for 14,000 RPM. By reducing the RPM to 4,000, we increase the shelf life of our centrifuges, uh, which means we're gonna have to change out our machinery uh, less frequently, which is very economical to our corporation. And our final step, the final design that we went with uh, for our pilot scale, uh, scale up is called simplified extraction two. So we, we have the number of unit operations needed to five. Uh, in this step, we succeeded in combining the extraction and the initial mixing step into one unit operation. Uh, we removed all the redundancies. We only have one centrifuge instead of three from the original design. Uh, we only have one filtration. We only have one filtration step, and in the end, we dilute with saline to get ready to ship an IV bag. So only one mixing step. So I'm going to go through a little bit more detail of our process. Um, might be a little unclear on this on this picture here, but um, we start out by um, introducing aloe vera leaf salt biomass with um, water and uh, extract it in a blender type of uh, unit operation. Um, the extract is then, then goes into the centrifuge where we separate the gel from the heavier solids. Um, then it is, goes from there to a dialyzer where these smaller molecules are, are um, diffused out of the um, process stream. Then for the filtration step, um, we are actually looking to run it through a sterilization filter for um, sterility. And then it goes into the final mixer for dilution, where then it goes to the uh, packaging stage. So after finalizing a design and going through a PFD, it was necessary to determine how feasible this process was on lab scale. So we, dis we started our proof of concept. So we try to replicate our simplified extraction two process as best as we could. Uh, we did need to make a change. We had to add uh, an extra um, filter step after our initial extraction step. We did succeed in using a blender so that we could extract and mix uh, in the first step at the, same, at the same time, which is what we hoped. We used a one-to-one -one water to aloe vera gel uh, by mass ratio for three samples. And then we half the water, so a one-to-two water to gel uh, ratio for the other three samples. We realized that having the water, halving the water made, uh, left our solution a little too viscous. So in the future, we wouldn't use that ratio. Uh, and uh, Additionally, we had to add that extra filter step because of this viscosity. Uh, but our original uh, idea of using a 0.22 micron filter did not work. So we had to deviate, which was okay. We used a depth filter uh, at the second point of this process. After the depth, uh, after the depth filter, uh, uh, the second filtration step worked. We used our 0.22 micron filter, and this worked because the viscosity was a lot less. Um, and our final AVDRP yield was estimated to be around 0.1%. Uh, the issue with working on uh, process buildup and a proof of concept over one semester is we'll need some more time to get some better results. However, we are happy because we do believe this process works and is feasible. We have an image here. After our first centrifugation step, you can see that there was very good separation between our solids and our uh, gel and water solution. Right, so I'm going to be talking a bit about the business aspect of things. Um, so for our business structure, we're setting our company up as a small corporation or an S-Corp. And we came to this conclusion because um, small corporations have the benefits of both an LLC and a corporation. Some of these benefits are operating tax deductions. So if you have a company that has high operating expenses year after year, it's important that these can be deducted, deducted from your taxes. 
Um, additionally, there's easily transferable ownership in corporations in the form of shares or stock options. Um, and generally, it's easier to get investments um, for a corporation because LLC's ownership is split up based on percentage between the owners. Um, investors are more gravitate and are more uh, comfortable investing in a company where they can actually have uh, share ownership or stock ownership. Um, additionally, there's pass-through taxation, which is similar to LLCs. Um, tax is only paid at the personal income level and not the operating level, um, as seen, or sorry, the corporate level as seen in uh, corporations, larger corporations, where there's double taxation. And lastly, there's no self-employment tax, and this is because the owner's salary is seen as an operating expense. So if a company has $100,000 in revenue and the owner's salary is $70,000, um, tax is only paid on the remaining $30,000. So um, in order to get into the market, we had to do a competitor analysis, and uh, Jason actually talked about this briefly earlier, um, but there are no current producers of ABDRP or a product similar to it that can be used in the treatment of HS. We did look at other drag producing polymers in industry as well as homeostatic agents. Um, one of them, as Jason mentioned, was polyethylene oxide, which has many medical and biological uses. However, it's ill-suited for use in high-stress environments, such as the treatment of HS, because it does break down in those environments, such as if it's, um, if it's uh, subject to high velocities or uh, high uh, turbulent environments. Um, yeah. So for marketing and sales, how we're actually planning on uh, getting our product out there, or the process, I say, which is what I want to emphasize, we're actually selling the process design and not a final product. So we're not targeting the individual patients or individual customers. We're targeting the companies, the biopharmaceutical companies that do have a similar line of products and may be interested in um, this process design. So commercials and ads will be ineffective as those target the actual individual, the individual consumer. Um, so we need a more professional approach. So sit downs with uh, biopharmaceutical companies, really explaining what the product is, um, if its benefits, as well as its profitability and why it's worth um, owning or buying the rights to uh, use the process. Um, the last, uh, one of the other major forms is healthcare conferences, such as the JP Morgan Healthcare Conference. And um, these attract thousands of both innovators and investors um, annually, and it's just a great way to uh, display and put out the word of new uh, groundbreaking technologies, drug products, and whatnot. Um, so this is another marketing a great marketing strategy. So our business model and how we actually plan on being profitable and making money since we are selling the process, we're going to have an initial patent purchase fee or basically the right to uh, use the process to make the product. Um, and this is going to be based on a safe value estimate of what the drug will be worth once it is marketable down the road. Um, and it's basically a multiple of what we expect the average annual sales or peak annual sales to be. And we found that in the biopharma industry, this is multiple of five. Um, on top of that, we're going to charge a royalty rate per unit sold from the company. Um, the average uh, royalty rate for approved drug products is around 12%. However, the typical range is between 8 and 18, or even higher, so it's 20 25%. But that's highly dependent on the profit, market, profit margin of the product. So if it has a high profit margin, then you can start charging <laughs> higher, higher royalty rates. But um, for business one and purposes, purposes uh, we calculated profitability based on ourselves producing and selling the drug at a fixed sales price. And um, this is also a major selling point for companies so that we can show profitability and why it's actually worth owning the rights and um, actually selling this product. And uh, Taylor's going to go a bit into those numbers. Uh, yeah, like Amir was saying, uh, we just wanted to look at what a pharma company could make if they adopted our process. and so. We performed a, an economic analysis on a, a pilot scale facility that they would, they would uh, possibly be running. So uh, here we have the capital costs for a facility like that. Um, I mean, the first thing you'll notice is that our equipment cost is very low. Uh, that is because we are actually, we would only need to process about 1,200 kilograms of aloe leaves a year. So, so yeah, we don't actually have a lot of equipment, or the sizing of the equipment uh, should be pretty small. And then our main cost actually comes from uh, property purchasing. So uh, this is how much it would cost to purchase property in Cambridge. Um, we just decided on Cambridge since um, a lot of pharma companies already operate there. And so we figured if they wanted a facility nearby, this would 
be a decent location. And um, obviously that, that can come down if they choose to uh, have the facility somewhere else. And then, so we have the um, ISPL, just by that taking a summation of all the purchases required. And then the OSPL, um, design engineering and contingency costs are all taken just as a percentage of that initial ISPL. And so we have a total fixed capital cost estimate of about $4.4 million. And so then we have our fixed cost of production here. Um, majority of this is actually just going to be uh, going to labor. Uh, we're going to have three shifts and then four operators per shift. And so that's how we have an a annual labor cost of $600,000. Um, and then the supervision and direct salary overhead are um, just calculated through a percentage of that labor cost. The maintenance cost, you'll notice, is very low. Um, that is, again, accounted for because of the low cost of all the equipment using and because of the, the, um, the small scale of our plant. And then so taking just a summation of all of these, we have a total fixed cost production of around $2 million a year. And then here's our variable cost of production. Um, so yeah, the, the main cost actually comes from purchasing IV bags since these need to be sterile. Um, so, and then of, of course, a, if a pharma company wanted to purchase more, this uh, price would probably go down, at least um, per bag, obviously. So the total of raw materials cost is about $3.9 million a year. Um, and then we counted, calculated the utilities cost for uh, each piece of equipment individually and that was about $4,000 a year. And then uh, we figured this was a bit low as an estimate for a whole for running a whole facility. So um, a normal farm company would uh, use about 20% of their raw materials cost to estimate the utilities cost. So we decided to just go a little lower to get in between our estimate and um, a larger company estimate. And so we took it as 10% of the raw materials cost. And so that gets a uh, total cost of production of about uh, $4.2 million a year. And then, so yeah, here we have all the, um, a summation of all the important numbers. Um, so assuming we have that 0.1% yield um, that we found in the lab, um, and then we're selling each bag for $30, which is a 100% markup, since uh, in each individual bag costs us about $15 to make. Um, a farm company, again, would also most likely have like almost a thousand percent markup on something like this, so the revenue would be much higher than this initial estimate. But we figured we'd try to keep it low because um, that would be, I mean, a cheaper product would be better for the consumer. So the revenue that we estimate is about fifteen million dollars a year, and then taking out the variable and fixed cost of production, uh, we have a gross profit of eleven point one million, and then taking again away for taxes. Our uh, final uh, net profit would be uh, six point nine million dollars a year. So, in conclusion, um, we determined that simple the simplified design SE two should be easily scalable because we addressed many of the redundancies and inefficiencies of Marhefka's and Kamenova's um, lab scale process. Um, the major one we addressed was the manual extraction of gel from the aloe leaves. So how they had done it in the lab was they basically just cut the aloe leaves and extract the gel from it. We turned this into an autonomous process that can be easily scalable. Um, the AVDRP yield from this process was estimated to be about 0.1%. What we'd like to do in the future is run for the tests to uh, get an average of the yield to determine if, it, if that 0.1% is accurate or not. The safe value estimation based on the numbers that Jason talked about earlier, so the 30 million, um, just the 30 million non-fatal US Injuries in the U.S. alone gives us a drug valuation of about 900 million in the future once it is marketable. Um, and then from this, the net profit of producing 500,000 bags of the ABDRP annually, as Jason mentioned, gives us a profit of 6.9 million. And then from this number, we've determined that we'd be profitable after about two years of operation, or the company, whichever company adopts this process, would be profitable or should be profitable after two years. Um, for future work, we want to determine if the polymer extracted using the SE2 is the actual um, desired AVDRP polysaccharide, and we do this through GPC testing of the molecular weight to determine the molecular weight of the final product and compare this to uh, literature results found by Marhefka and uh, Kameneva. Mm -hmm.
Additionally, we want to confirm that there's no detrimental effects from removing the cooling and um, several of the steps. So the cooling was for sterility concerns. Um, and if we do test the final product and there is contamination or there is something um, off with it, we'll either have to add the cooling back in or determine other sterility steps that have to be added to address those issues. We'd like to thank Professor Ben Sharif for his polymer expertise, his guidance, his assistance, and his allowance in using his lab. Uh, a very big thank you and a deep appreciate, appreciation to Zach Rogers for giving us countless hours of his time over the last month in doing our proof of concept testing. Uh, also, thank you to Ada Krua for helping us with the lab testing as well. And lastly, we'd like to thank our mentor all the way in California. Her name is Rachel Marillo. Uh, it was tough with the time difference, but she edited our papers, gave us feedback, and we very much appreciate everything she did for us. Yep. So if anyone has questions, we would love to take them now. Thank you very much. Initially, you said all the fluid the transfusion uh, does some side effects. That's why you guys can not to use this uh, technique or stay away. Is blood one of the fluid? Uh, is blood included in one of the fluid that you were talking about? Yes. So the fluid tr fluid transfusions we were discussing um, are they include uh, you know generally water and also blood. So blood transfusions are a common way of um, currently treating hemorrhagic shock. Although they're moving towards hypotensive resuscitation because it's, um, they've seen um, better results in clinical trials um, for that method. Okay. Also, also um, we're we're not trying to replace the existing solutions. We just we just have the the uh, solution that's in the pre-hospitalization period. So if um, the effects of hemolytic shock are elongated because of because the individual doesn't receive proper treatment, um, maybe the final solutions are less likely to succeed, which is why like um, fluid transfusion um, sees issues, or maybe even happen with the resuscitation as well. Okay, so um, so you're pretty much injecting a viscous solution, right, mm -hmm. to the patient, mm -hmm. right? So do you know what? Um, so at which point you will uh, offer your therapy? Let's say patient has a lot of uh, blood loss, right? So do you think the therapy would be good enough by itself or it needs to be combined with blood transfusion? Um, it, it would absolutely need to be com combined with blood transfusions. Um, however, um, during that initial period, there have been negative effects of immediately um, transfusing lots of blood. So you get high blood pressure um, and potentially uh, organ damage as well from uh, massive blood transfusions. So as I was saying before there, they've been moving towards hypotensive resuscitation where they limit the amount of transfusions that they, they do. Um, so with this in combination with that method where you're getting better dif um, diffusion of oxygen into the blood um, as well as um, keeping the blood pressure down and um, so it kind of count would counteract those effects uh, there. So, but in the end you would still need to get a blood transfusion. Mm -hmm. right, um, so your yield is pretty low. You said 0.1%? Is yeah. the max you can get, or this is just still on progress and you, you can improve that? Uh, it's still on progress. We'd have to keep doing further testing to improve that number. Um, that's why, like, future work, we'd like to run some more tests, determine that an average yield. Um, maybe there's some things you have to refine about the process, um, such as we had to use an added depth filter in the, um, in the proof of concept because our initial solution was too viscous to go through the 0.22 micron filter and we believe we got some contamination, like water contamination, into the sample. Um, so we addressed some of the, we fine-tuned some of the steps um, in order to try to increase that yield. Okay. How does it compare to others that are reported in the literature? Um, we couldn't, uh, I don't think they had yield information in yeah, the yeah. Uh, Marhefka and Kaminova process. Um, and, and they were the only ones that we really saw doing it at the lab scale. Okay. Um, but keep in mind that that number is of the total mass of, of aloe vera leaves. So of that mass, only probably half of it is, maybe 70% of it is gel. So from there, then we're trying to, to basically get if the yield from the gel. Guess, what would be the max percent? Uh, I would guess around three or four percent. Okay. Yeah. Uh, even with our tip scale testing, as they were saying, we added quite a few dilution steps, so that really ruined our yield. But I would say three or four percent. Yeah, I would guess, or maybe five percent. Yeah. Okay. 
that would be huge compared to New Yeah, right. Right. That, would that would be a, a drastic significant. difference, yeah. So, um, do you know what polymers are in aloe vera? It's a mix, right? Uh, yeah, they're, uh, they're very long carbohydrate chains okay. that we're looking at. They haven't actually specifically identified like what um, is in the chain since it's a uh, it's very long polymer, but that is what the but actual DFE is. And, so, uh, and we know the, su the, the size of the polysaccharide we're trying to classify is greater than 50,000 dollars. So okay, yeah. this is some information yeah. we know and further testing will, will be needed. Yeah. It has a, a molecular weight of around 800,000 Daltons, I believe, yeah. from, yeah. from uh, Marhafka and Kimnova's okay. testing. Are you doing dialysis at some point? Uh, yes. Yeah. So you are excluding some low molecule. Yeah, so that yes. the dialysis, the cutoff is the 50,000 Daltons. Okay. Um, so anything smaller than that would be filtered out. Do you see a, an increase in viscosity at a given concentration after dialysis? We, we didn't uh, have the ability to find that. The samples were very small. It was hard to compare to what it was before. Yeah, in, in the end we had, I think, 0.3 ml samples. Yeah, because the, yeah. the dialysis kit we had to use just uh, had very small sample sizes, so we kind of, yeah. it was hard to compare the end viscosity to what it was uh, before we ran dialysis. Um, what would be the concentration of your polymer in your saline solution? Uh, it's five milligrams per liter. So, in a, yeah, that's what would be injected into yeah, a so human. What do you come up with this number? Who is this number? Um, that is what had, was used to test on um, the concentration that was used for rats in testing. Okay. So we just wanted to keep the actual concentration uh, the same as the research had been done. Okay. Uh, is there any side effects using high, high molecule weight polymers <laughs> injected like the have they, haven't, they haven't found them so far. So one, one benefit of it is that uh, it, for the reduction of uh, turbulent uh, resistance to turbulent flow is that it doesn't actually affect the blood that's uh, flowing laminarly. Laminarly. So um, that is one benefit. Um, however, as far as I'm aware, they haven't, um, we couldn't find any, any side effects that were discussed. Um, yeah, from the research that, from the lab testing that the Russian scientists did, uh, they did a lot of testing on rats, which is what a lot of scientists do, and there were no negatives. They had a big, they kept control groups, uh, and then they had the ones that were actually injected with AVDRPs, and then they uh, sliced them, they exposed them to hem hemorrhagic shock, and all the rats who had the AVDRP injected, all, all of them survived longer. Yeah, so. So do you know, is it cleared by the body? Since you are dealing with high molecular weight, Sure. That's something you would have to look into. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you.